Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back, Rock the Stage Show, on Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and we're in for a great treat once again. Thanks for joining us, whether you're on PPN, the Public Place Network, we're streaming globally on the PPN, and they are ever expanding. And hello to any of those people in Poland watching along on PPN. It's great to know you're here with us as well. I was totally surprised that we have fans in Poland already, so thank you. And of course, on YouTube, if you're tracking along here on Sunday night, the live chat party is going on. So jump into the chat, ask questions, make comments, and have fun as we go along here tonight. You know, I have been in sports broadcasting. I love sports, and I love sports. And one of the best parts of this time of year is the playoffs, baseball. And now it's not just baseball that I love. I love watching coaches. I love those games where it's tied up, it's getting late in the night, and the coaches are the most important people on the field at that time. And it's a battle of the wits between who's going to make the right shift, the right trade, the right batter come on in, and it's the battle of coaches. Now, those are real great games. But you know what? Many people kind of laugh at the idea of having a personal coach. A lot of people don't understand the power of a coach to help you go to the next level, to move forward. You may have heard many athletes, actors, talk about, even though I'm as good as I am, I have a personal coach. Where do you stand on that? Are you looking for a coach? Do you want a coach? Well, tonight we're going to get into this whole area of life coaching. One of the early pioneers of coaching. Pat is often called the ambassador of life coaching. A licensed psychologist since 1980, Pat began the executive coaching in 1990 with Hewlett Packard, IBM, Kodak, and other major companies, along with the Front Range of Colorado. Welcome, author, speaker, mentor, Dr. Patrick Williams, to Rock the Stage Show. Thank you so much. What a great intro. <laughs> You know, ambassador of life coaching. I've met several different ambassadors along the way, yeah, formal yeah. and informal. Tell me how you got that tag. That's really cool. Well, actually, a few of my students in the early days just said I was that. Because when I started, life coaching was kind of new. And then I wrote my first book in 2001, Therapist as Life Coach. So it was the helping professionals who wanted to add coaching to their repertoire, not jump ship, maybe, like I did. But... Um, I kept, you know, starting to get international students and I, I just really talked it up. Life coaching is one of those things like psychology in the early days that a lot of the comedy shows made fun of, you know, Saturday Night Live, everybody. But no matter what you call yourself, executive coach, leadership coach, what it's all life coaching. We're coaching the person, not the problem. And so I became through acclamation, I guess, uh, with ambassador. And I said, great, where is my where is my, uh, my, you know, ambassadorial castle? I said, how about the Caribbean? You know, I'd like that. So never well, happened. The Colorado range is not a bad yeah. place to hang yeah. out. Yep. Yep. <laughs> now you did just mention therapist versus coach. Uh-huh. What's the big distinguisher? Do people do kind of blur the lines or they don't care about either one. <laughs> so yeah. what's the difference? Well, yeah. In the early day, I mean, I was kind of, hired to speak at a lot of places to help that distinction. And it's if in the simplest terms, um, life coaching is a partnership or leadership coaching, whatever you want to call it. We'll say life coaching, personal coaching. Whereas um, psychotherapy traditionally was kind of a doctor patient, kind of a hierarchical, you've got some diagnosable condition. I'm the professional. And mostly that happened in North America because of our insurance situation. So colleges would give you a diagnosis of adjustment disorder with mixed emotional features so we could bill insurance. Well, to me, that sounds like waking up in the morning, frankly. But um, So coaching became that egalitarian partnership without being an advisor role. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know your life. I'm not diagnosing you. I'm not fixing you. I'm helping you expand your thinking, consciousness, we could say, and choices you might make from new thinking. Oh, that's nice. It's very clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Bill Gates once said this, everyone needs a coach 
It doesn't matter whether you're a basketball player, a tennis player, a gymnast, or a bridge player. Yeah. Everyone needs a coach. Do you believe in that? Because I've heard that so often. Everyone needs a coach. Yeah. And, and the former CEO of Home Depot years ago said the same thing. But I changed that a little bit, saying it, 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 you don't necessarily need a coach, but you deserve one. Ooh. Because I can coach myself all day long. But as soon as I talk out loud to a committed listener who's a partner in my corner, I hear myself differently and I get new thinking. Most coaches ask evocative question. It's not like a ski coach that's helping you make the turn or a quarterback coach that reminds some pro quarterback, um, Mahomes, okay, let's say Mahomes, um, <laughs> who, who just has to be tweaked. They're already great. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the coaching that happens in the corporate world or in uh, professional coaching is more about the who that the client is more than what they do. That's what's going to bring greatness. So when you get a call from someone that's a high executive and say, look, I need, I need to go to the next level. I know I'm the cap on the business now and I, I need to be pushed. Where do you start with someone that's literally saying, take me there? Well, it, okay, I'll interject a funny story because when I got my start with Hewlett Packard, Kodak, all those around the front range of Colorado, I was a psychologist and this human resources firm hired me to coach executives of a team that was going off to a team building weekend and they were going to come back all enthused to do things, right? It found out that nothing got implemented if the executive of their team, manager, whatever, wasn't involved in the changes they were going to bring back. It would just sit on the table. So that was one. How can you, as, as an executive or leader of this team, facilitate ways that implemented changes can occur? Mm -hmm. from the excitement of the team. The other thing in the early days was it was a lot of what we call remedial coaching. I was sent a client for six months of coaching or else. I mean, they oh. were getting coaching to improve themselves, become a better leader, become less aloof with their staff, whatever. They were problematic. Nowadays, it's shifted to high potential um, people. If somebody refers themselves because they've heard about me, uh, or I get, I get a lot of government referrals over the years. I've worked for the FAA department of defense and to take it to the next level. That's kind of one of those terms of what the heck does that mean? So yeah, it's like, what does it mean? Where, so where are you stuck? Where are you not performing as you want? Uh, what's your image of where you'd like to be in one to three to five years? So those are the kind of questions we ask that are evoking new thinking from the client. I don't have a book on. How to be, whether our books, how to be a better leader, but I don't read those. It's more, uh, what do you want and who do you need to be to get there? See, there's that who, right? Not, not what do you need to do differently, but who do you need to be to absorb these changes in you, which as a leader is really going to be being a leader, not a dictator with your team. So when I've had these conversations with people, I, I, I've, I've got into that area of, well, why do they think they're able to coach me? <laughs> Who do they think they are that they can add anything to what I already do? But right. that's kind of the point. You you don't want to be in the trenches with them. You want to be separate, right? Right. Yeah. So, and, and I might get a client referred to me who is not a good fit. So I'll say, you know, I really think you need a coach who's going to work more with uh, team building or team, you know, whatever. I don't do that. But I might do individual coaching about where do you want to be in your life and your work that will make you happier, more fulfilled, more, uh, you know, whatever it might be. When I get referrals over the years, the confidentiality states that I can only report back to the paying body, the FAA or whomever, um, yep. what they wanted reporting on with the client's permission. They sign off on the report. But if they want to come in and talk to me about their marriage, their health, that they want to quit working here, uh, that doesn't go in the report. But we can talk about that. <laughs> so there is a line of delineation between if you're hired by the parent company to work with yes. Bobby or Susie, there yep. is a line that separates. Yeah. In, in the International Coach Federation under ethical guidelines, it's we, we can never report to the company who hired us except with the client's permission because that's triangulating. They might be paying for the coaching, 
Wow. But he or she should be able to talk about whatever they want. And then the results that the company wanted should be evident if they made progress. You know. Now, I, I, I know you worked in something called transpersonal psychology. Right. Where, where does all that play into this? And what the heck is that? Yeah. It means beyond the person or literally it means without the mask. Persona means mask in Greek. Oh. So transpersonal is like being more real, being more who you are, getting to the soul, mind, body, spirit, you know, which today there's more proof about what I was trained in meditation, mm -hmm. yoga, early stage biofeedback. All of a sudden we started getting the scientific proof of what was so called taught from 6,000 year old philosophies. Right. Um, yeah. So. That does play into our world today because the big thing right now is be more authentic. Yes. Be more authentic. Be more right. authentic. And it's coming in all sectors and even in the media world. People are dying for break the celebrity mold, the Hollywood glam, and just be authentic through me, through the camera. And we talk about that all the time. Yeah. So it is interesting how that's come all the way around. What, what do you think made that happen? Why are we back there again? Well, we're back there in a in a better way it's kind of at the same point but spiraled up so there's more wisdom than there was in the days of the encounter groups and the getting in an encounter group and saying what the hell you wanted about somebody with no holds barred that wasn't always helpful that was sometimes no. helpful um, but nowadays i even wrote another book called getting naked on emotional intelligence i was going to ask you about that book. yeah right time right place right person so it doesn't mean share yourself authentically with everybody because you can get in trouble right um, I think the push, especially in media, I mean, if you're talking about actors or basketball well, stars or it's whatever, a big shift. It, it, because they're all playing a role, you know, they're, um, and some people get so tied up in that role, they forget what reality is. <laughs> um, so I think the trend is, well, and here's where, okay, we've, we've been suffering from a loneliness crisis since even before COVID. And that's social media, that's lack of connection, that's lack of things that really connect people with society, which the Harvard study of 85 years on longevity, the number one ingredient that will help you live longer is social connection, not isolation. Well, and I've had several guests on that have touched on that very thing. In fact, uh, a report came out, a study of the loneliest places in the United States. Where would you guess that what would be? Where's it at? The loneliest place in the United States? Yeah. Probably L.A. or New York, I would guess, you know. Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's our nation's capital with a lot of crap going on in the streets. But And every time I talk to somebody about that living here in D.C., they're like, well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. Because you have the rotation every four years of presidential teams, oh, families. They're oh. in, they're out. The senators, two years in it. So yeah. it's an endless rotation of people. So just when you begin to get to know somebody, they're gone. That's a good point. Yeah. How? And it's growing that way more and more. How do we break that cycle to either build relationship better, faster, or we learn to deal with it? Well, there's that. I'm just thinking out loud about if somebody in that position is authentic. I mean, I don't think we should have senators for 40 some years like Mitch McConnell or right. I don't think you should be a lifetime politician. It's supposed to be a civil servant. When did that stop? Um, but on the other hand, if you have a chance to be real instead of play into the media, now, I don't know how to do that. I mean, there, there's there's some politicians that have gotten in trouble for telling the truth, you know, yeah. back, back in the days of. Uh, a, a presidential candidate who cried, you know, oh, my God, oh, my God. Um, and then you have people who are more authentic, like Jimmy Carter, and he got smashed because he, you know, wasn't. So, right. I, yeah. But then now, today, they respect him for being that honest. And yeah. now the respect he's earned today is unbelievable. Right. He did the right, right thing for the right yeah. reasons, paid for it, but now they love him. Yeah, he had, had kind of a bad staff because he was so trusting. And then he had... Uh, the things in Beirut happened and everything, yeah. or, you know, so, but I think, I think the goal being authentic doesn't mean sharing your whole soul anywhere, anytime, but in important relationships, if you can be honest, whether it's with your wife, your kids, your friends, your neighbors, just enough um, 
years ago, I think about four years ago, I wrote an article for Forbes coaching on uh, authenticity in the workplace. And I remember quoting the new CEO of Goldman Sachs. Can't remember his name at the time. But he said, our policy is going to be when somebody comes to work and we say, hi, how are you? We really want to know the answer to that. And not the long story, but if I say, oh, God, thanks for asking. My wife and I were up all last night because our 16-year-old just informed us she's pregnant. What are we going to do? And the boss can say, wow, that's got to be hard. Thanks for sharing. If there's anything you need today, let me know. Right. That's it. You don't have to tell the story. Right. And you don't have to make it your story. Like, oh, yeah, my daughter did that. No, none of that me too listening. <laughs> it's it's listening with a reverence and no need to fix. Just now, is, is, that, is that like a let the air out a little bit so you can go to work, you can focus? Like you come in. You yeah, 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 yeah. You're yeah. actually letting them go, okay, we're, we're, we're going to let it breathe yeah. it out. And then you can go back to work now. Yeah, because the science on it, if we hold in emotions, and here's the neurology today. You, if you're hooked up to a brain machine and you share something with, you know, an FSR, F, F, MRI, I guess they're called. Um, if you express an emotional angst of some sort, your brain will light up differently. That will go away. A different part of the brain lights up. So emotions are actually emotion, energy and motion. And that's not just a misnomer. That is true. There's an energetic heart to heart. This comes from the Heart Math Institute, by the way. It's not we'll get science. Your heart resonance, when you're an empathetic person, you're connecting to the other person with heart energy. There really is an electrical energy where you're you're in sync. You know, in the 70s, they used to call it good vibes, man. Yeah. Well, they were kind of right. There really is vibrations that connect us. That's fascinating. Because again, as, as you said a few minutes ago, we aren't connecting too well right now. We are still trying to get back post-COVID. There's a lot of studies right. out there about people have not gone back to normal behaviors. Right. And so we aren't connecting. So what's happening to that energy then? Because if we're all kind of wired that way, but we have this energy, what where's it going and what's it doing to us? Well, people, I mean, Zoom has kind of taken over. It was I, I was on Zoom way before COVID. That's just the way we taught our school. I used to own a coaching school. And actually, the first 20 years, it was by teleconferencing, no visual. And I did my first 25 years of coaching teleconferencing. I actually think I connected better without the visual. Huh. Now, now, when I'm doing a class, the visual is great. I can see people, you can raise your hand. But I think one-on-one -on -one coaching unless you're in the person's office, which happens a lot in executive, I like just doing it by phone. And I give all my clients that option. We don't have to see each other. Um, I think it can be more distracting. I might look at your screens behind you. I might look <laughs> at the dog coming into the room, I, you know, whatever. It can be friendly, but it can also be distracting. And that's just a personal choice. Coaching in the ICF competencies, the number one competency of the eight, I think is presence. And mm -hmm. presence comes from a real set of connection. Now here, here's where we go back to emotions. If there's something going on in your life as the coach that you can't leave outside the door, yeah. you're not ready to coach that person. You need to be, you need to be able to be present uh, because you're not bringing your story into it. You're not trying to fix or share or whatever. Mm -hmm. And little things like an argument you just have with your daughter or something doesn't need to affect you, but you need to take a break. We always start coaching calls this way, by the way. I do. Yeah. Say, all right, is there anything you need to say or get rid of before we start coaching? And that doesn't mean a problem. It means something you need to let go of. Yeah. Five minutes, okay? And then we start coaching. It shifts the mindset of coaching versus chatting. Now, you just mentioned coaching competency or there are different levels and different traits sort of what yes. are those? because I've never heard. I've always wondered what makes a great coach. But if I do it from memory, the number one is creating the agenda for the call. And that's a whole skill set. Then there's presence. Then there's listening. There's trust and safety. There's um, creating goals for them when they leave the call. You know, what are they going to put into action? I don't want to tell them. What, so what did you get out today and what are you going to move forward with? Those so a lot of it really is you're, you're reflecting, sending back, and they really have to do the big work of saying, I need to do this. Right. 
and I'll be back next month and I'll let you know how that worked out. Right. But at the PCC level, if I get a client who's really is turning into a consultant, they're trying to help, they're trying to advise, they're giving suggestions. And that's not coaching. Well, and that and that brings up a great point because there's so many right now that are, I'm a life coach. I have it on my website. Right. Wait, wait, wait. Are you really a life coach? Right. How do we know? A qualified life coach versus a non qualified because they ain't gonna put it on their website, their letter yep. their business yep. cards. Yep. How do we know? Well, first of all, I say the word consultant isn't licensed either. And there's a lot of consultants, some bad, some good. So you have to be, you know, do your due diligence. There there was two articles this summer about somebody who got duped out of twenty five thousand dollars by a so called life coach. It's like, well, you know, don't be so I don't want to be so strong, but don't be so gullible, you know, because ask the person where they trained, where, where did you get your train? I mean, it, I can say I'm a consultant and not have any wherewithal. I can have scammed. I'm going to sell things to you. That's going to improve your life. That's BS. <laughs> um, so I think people need to do their due diligence. And if you can find a coach certified by the international coach federation, you can pretty much guarantee that they're going to be ethical and trained. Now, I also know you do work in the area of mentorship or you speak on mentorship, which right. is near and dear to my heart. I, I believe in mentorship. And from my viewpoint, you're really blending, rubbing shoulders, you're getting in there together. And a mentor right. really makes a semi clone of themselves. Almost they yep. rub it off so much, they become a mini version. What do you do with mentorship and what's your view on the power of mentorship? Because I think it's a lost art today. Yeah, well, mentorship. Okay, so back to the difference between therapy and coaching. I used to have a Venn diagram of therapy, coaching, mentoring, counseling. Mentoring traditionally is helping somebody do what you do. They're going to move up the ladder to be a um, a, a full time teacher, or a, they're going to learn skill sets. They're going to move. You're, you're actually teaching and coaching a little bit, right? In the coaching world, I mentor those who want to go for certification. So I'm mentoring them to improve their coaching skills, not their helping skills, because that's the trap. You want to help. You want to help. You want to give advice to the person. You want to tell, oh, have you read this book? Yeah, we can do that sometimes. You might consider this book, but but um, we're not trying to fix their problem. I need to know what coaching is. They need to know what their life is. I mean, I don't know their life. Right. So I can coach anybody willing to that. The other way that mentoring shows up for me uh, is in the last couple of years, I focused on wanting to help people in the second half of their life. I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm an alum of the Modern Elder Academy, which started in Cabo and now it's in Santa Fe. And they've got people that come to the trainings. It was started by Chip Conley. And there's a whole thing. But they focus on midlife. Getting yeah. beyond midlife. Okay. So I'm now focusing on the concept of relevance and reverence to become a wise elder in the traditional sense, like in indigenous cultures. In other words, not just retire, move to Florida and play golf. That's not eldering. Right. right? And retirement, by the way, comes from the French means to disappear or go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, retirement is not anywhere in my vocabulary. Right. No, no, but no I'm the, repurposing. But the, but the idea of being a wise owl. Right. Yeah, I say yes. I'm repurposing. How how much are we needing that here in the United States? Because around the world, that's part of their culture very often, the wise owl. But here in the States, we don't have that, do we? Well, that's one movement I'd like to see change because relevance becomes, I'm not just old and moving to my retirement home with a bunch of people my same age, I'm still finding purpose, working with younger people, yes. getting involved in community projects, whether it be Rotary or church or something, um, mentoring from the wise elders, yes. which means, you know, in traditional Native American or other tribal, they're the wisdom keepers. Now, that doesn't mean I know the answers to your challenge, but I have a whole bunch of life experience I might have some questions to ask, like, well, what's the challenge for you, young brave? <laughs> what do you need to overcome? Um, 
I work a lot with stories in that case, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the Navy tells stories, but it's not a story with here's what you should do. It's a metaphorical mm -hmm. exploration of, uh, oh, where the person might go, oh, oh, okay. I can do that. I can do that. So as a Boy Scout, we had several wise owls. Yes. Uh, and as a youngster, I ate that up. Yeah. Having someone in their 60s, and look, it seems so old back then. Right. right. Uh, but now <laughs> at almost 60, it, it's not old. But then I was also involved with an organization which the name is no longer politically correct, and I don't think it even exists, but it was Indian Guides. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Indian Guides did talk about yeah. the parental role, the wisdom to the child, the grandchild. It was part of their teachings. And yeah. the impact of both those old organizations have always stuck with me about we need the wise owls in our life. Well, here's my wooden wooden owl, which is a <laughs> which is a, a, a Russian. There's eight of them that go inside of here. Little, yes, little, the Russian doll. But I was in Boy Scouts through went through Eagle Scout, Order the Arrow, We Blow, yes. all, everything, and it was great. It was really great. Uh, but yeah, there were some Indian rituals that were part of that, getting your name and having the black drink and you know going off on a walkabout um but that's an that was an important part of cultural right touring, i think have we lost some of that by not yes having these very intentional relationship driven yes sort of vibe organizations whatever right and now we got boy scouts becoming the scout it's men and yeah. women and you know yeah. i don't I mean, I'm really open-minded, but I think that could be a mistake. It's just mm -hmm. too bad. Um, my idea for, I mean, I'm 75. Yep. So, so I want to be available and personal to not just youth. I mean, a 60-year-old can mentor a 50-year-old. Yeah. One of the questions I ask in my workshop to the men is, what would you have told yourself 20 years ago that would help you today? Yeah. You know, that's the kind of advice or mentoring you can work with somebody else. Where can you be a positive influence? Through my local Rotary Club, I help with kids pack, filling baskets of food for weekend kids that don't have much food. 700 a week in our little town of Loveland, Colorado. Yeah. Um, because there's they don't have food for the weekend. And we get all that through mm -hmm. donations and stores and farmers fields, et cetera. Um, how many people are blurring the lines, mixing the lines of coaching versus mentorship? Are there people, and I, I think they're right, but I, I think I met them, but they don't know what they're really doing. So yeah. call coaching one day, mentorship another day, and they're going back and forth. Yeah, I don't have any idea of the numbers, but that's a lot of people who misinterpret. I mean, because again, the term coach is not licensable, you know, and I don't want it to get licensed because if I have a client in Scotland, where am I supposed to have my license? Right. You know, that's going to be a problem. But I think the, the accreditation, certification, finding out who's viable as a coach. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody wants to advertise on their website that I coach and mentor, great. You can coach and consult. I've taught a lot of managers in the workplace to learn the coach approach, but that doesn't stop them from also advising. Right. Because their, their career is not being a coach. They're just using coaching principles. Whereas a certified life coach or a master certified coach, we are sticking with pure coaching, unless we're not, you know, if I go off teaching or if I go off doing a workshop, that's not coaching. Well, life coaching also has that barrier. The, as, as you pointed out earlier, I'm not here to give you the answer. I'm here right. to find the answer. So, right. right. Yes. It's, and it's not that we believe the client already has the answers within. Here's what I believe. The answers to some of their dilemmas come from, the questions that are asked and the space, the pause, the listening that brings up new insight from somewhere. Maybe it's from a super conscious out in the world. I don't know, but it comes from somewhere. It doesn't come from me. Right. I don't have to tell them how to fix the problem. We explore it. You know, and that's what's fun. I had to learn to shut up more when I became a coach over a psychologist. I really did. I had to learn to listen longer. And I'm a, on the Myers-Briggs personality test. I'm an ENFP, so I'm an extrovert. So okay. I, while I talk 
And I can think three seconds is a long time to wait, you know, but now we, we teach ourselves to just be quiet. And if we're on Zoom, I can, I can observe your energy as a client. Yeah. If we're on the phone, I can still hear you take a sigh, voice gets mm-hmm. quieter. I mean, I can tell when somebody's having emotional reactions or um, frustration. or I don't have to see the body, you know. Now, in sports coaching, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, there is that part of kicking in the butt, you know, which yep. button to push and not to yep. push. As, as a guy who has studied coaches all of his life, they're not just being jerks to be a jerk. They're being a jerk to push the right button for the right results. So they know where to go. Right. It may bother the athlete or the parent that sees it, but the coach really knows what they're doing. Is that part of your role as a coach too, to know which button to push or not? In the moment, I don't have a guidebook over here like, oh, this is when I use right. this. Now, a football coach, a basketball coach. I mean, I'm a you know, Kansas Jayhawk true blue from when I went to college and love their basketball team. Bill Self is one of those coaches. Um, you know, there's been others that the players already know basketball. He's going to be coaching to bring out a little bit better nuance. And when yes. he takes a player out of the game, he doesn't throw chairs and kick them like some coaches were known to do. My favorite, Bobby Knight. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he does say, all right, you you threw the pass. You guys were on a weave. And, and what happened? What happened? So when you go back in there, that I want you to know that. So it's kind of a teaching moment. Now he mm. might lose his temper a little bit, like, what were you thinking? You know, <laughs> pass the ball. But um, it's a combination of skill building, which is early coaching is learn the sport. Masterful coaching in the sports arena is to bring out the best in athletes, which is what the best do. Shashevsky, Bill mm-hmm. Self, others, they take players who maybe are not highly ranked, but they – they help them develop themselves with confidence and become a draft pick. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but also many of those players step back and they'll mention yes. Coach K was more than a basketball coach. Coach yes. K was a mentor. Coach K taught me oh, a lot. Absolutely. Coach K told me how to be a young man. They are coaches beyond sports coaching. Yeah. Yeah. When when famous coaches have died and, and players went to the funeral or something, you heard that. This guy was like yeah. a father to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, before we wrap up here a little bit, tell me about the Emotional Literacy Academy. What the heck is that all about? All right. Well, I, I so on the book, Getting Naked, which I mentioned, I yeah. create I created an online course. And in the early days, I found that if I called it gettingnaked.com, people went to some websites that weren't really good to go to. So I had to change it. So emotional literacy is really what it's about. It's like, literacy is not emotional intelligence. It's like being literate. What do you, what do you do as you understand your fears and constraints? And so it's a 12 module course online recorded. Um, and it's based on my book, getting naked, but it's much more than that. It's got stories. It's got my voice recording. It's got exercises and it, people that are coaches can get credit at the end of it. If you're not a coach, it's just, very um, inspiring and influential to you. Well, speaking about your website, we are going to share in right now that there's a QR code. It takes you directly to the website that was just being referenced. But what else are you going to find there besides several of your books I saw there too? Yeah, there's a lot hidden on that website. I'm actually redoing it to a point where I'm maybe only going to have three pages. I don't need all that background stuff anymore. I'm not trying to build a business anymore. But yeah, my books are all on Amazon. There's four main books. They've been rewritten, uh, second and third editions. And if anybody's interested, a couple of them are now in Korean. And uh, I can't read them. But, you know, uh, and they're all in audiobook and um, and Kindle as well. So Amazon.com, Dr. Pat Williams in there. If you go to my website, if upper right-hand corner, about, there'll be publication, publications and books. So. And Dr. Pat, going back to the very beginning, you've been one of the founders of some of these movements and organizations. What's some of the biggest changes you've seen from your earliest days through founding those to now the world of coaching now? Yeah, it's interesting. I always say that's why I have gray gray hair. You know, I'm a founding (laughs) member of the International Coach Federation. I'm a founding member of Harvard's Institute of Coaching. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
a founding member of, you know, a lot of places because I, I was around when it started. It's become international. It's mm -hmm. become research based. I mean, there are research that comes out of uh, Case Western uh, Institute that's got research on the efficacy of coaching. That's powerful. And that's very powerful. Um, I think it's become more defined, refined, um, and it's become more visible to the community. I mean, it used to be, what the heck's a coach? I used to, when I first moved to Florida for a while, I was like, really, you're a coach? What sport? Yes. The game of life, you know? Life. Uh, so it was kind of tough because there was that presumption, pre-assumption of what it was. But now it's pretty visible. It's not like it's not like there's a talk show about coaching. But more and more people have heard about it. More and more companies are encouraging it and in some cases requiring it. And the young people in Gen X and Gen Z, yes. when they get hired, they're asking for a coach. That's a big difference. And that goes back to what I was talking about with that mentorship of Boy Scouts and Indian guides. We crave that. And yeah. it skipped a couple of generations, I think. But now they're realizing, I want the grandfather of my life. I right. want that father figure to sit down and tell me this stuff. Right. I put my face in the mud too many times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There are companies that have internal coaches where they're actually hired by Hewlett Packard to be on. I mean, Google had their own life coach for a long time, you know, um, and that's helpful. But do you still have the objectivity and the confidentiality? So, Dr. Pett, as we wind down here today, I'm curious for a minute. We've been talking about the coaching side, the coaching side. I want to flip the table to the one that needs to be coached. What advice would you give somebody to be the best coachable person they could be to work with someone like yourself so they get the most out of it? It goes back to need a coach versus deserve a coach. You know, a coach is a partner. It's an investment in you becoming more productive, happier, healthier. I mean, all those things can happen. The wheel of life assessment that a lot of coaches use is six, seven areas of a life that it's not a wheel like a tire. If you're, if you're low and I don't like where I live, so your community rating is kind of low. That's not a bumpy tire. That's just an energy wheel that your mm. satisfaction is, is not high there. Um, I mean, I'm rambling, but it's like if, if that's something a person really wants to work on, say, well, how can you make the community you live in more connected to you or where would you like to move? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and often they may want a coach, but they don't know what to do with it. Exactly. Coach. Exactly. So it's most coaches have a welcome packet, not an intake sheet. That sounds therapeutic. But a welcome packet is, here's who I am. Here's how I work. Here's some beginning questions I have for you to think about. Then we'll have an initial call to just see if it's going to work for you. And then I like to coach, like have the person buy six or 12 sessions, and then we reevaluate. Perfect. You know, it's not forever. <laughs> Dr. Pat Williams with us today. And again, thank you for taking your time to be with us here again. Remember, go to his website, check it out, and learn more about him. Thank you, Dr. Pat, for being with us today. Around My school. pleasure. My pleasure. And he lives in one of the most beautiful places in the world, Colorado, right in the mountain range. If that doesn't make you feel better working with a coach, I don't know what will. Oh, just breathe in that good old country air. Hey, that's going to do it for this edition of Rock the Stage Show. Don't forget to come back every weekend, 7 p.m. Sunday nights. We go on with another great in-depth conversation with leaders from around the world and He's the ambassador of life coaching. What a great title. You never know who's going to show up here from where they come in the world, but bringing you the best of the best. Actors, directors, authors, speakers, influencers, and even life coaches right here on Rock the Stage. We'll see you back here next week, 7 p.m. Eastern time for another edition of Rock the Stage Show.